can't uh, speak English fluently, then uh, it will be translated by your, Carmen. By Carmen. Hmm? Uh, well, okay. Um, mi intención era hablarles un poco de la uh, presencia de Girard en el debate eh, que eh, en el contexto del nacionalismo vasco y sobre el, el terrorismo de ETA eh, tuvo lugar en los años 80 y 90 del de pasado siglo. Um, como ustedes saben, la... Um, eh, actividad terrorista de ETA, de una organización, eh, de la organización nacionalista vasca, finalizó ¿sí? hace unos, unos pocos años, pero digamos a lo largo de, de medio siglo, desde 1968 hasta eh, fechas bastante recientes, eh, y introdujo, digamos, a España en una espiral de, de violencia que no concluyó en, en absoluto con la, con, la muerte de, con la muerte de Franco. Eh, habría que recordar... ¿Quieres traducir, Carmen? No. Habría que recordar eh, cómo se produce el eh, retorno de la, de la violencia... Eh, de la violencia terrorista digamos, a Europa Occidental eh, después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Hay una fecha que fue, fue clave, eh, tanto digamos, para España como para el conjunto de Europa, el, el 27 de octubre de 1960, cuando eh, la Unión de Estu Nacional de Estudiantes de, de Francia, reunida, digamos, en, en esos momentos en la eh, Salle de la Mutualité en, en París, digamos, para celebrar una asamblea eh, contra, digamos, la eh, intervención en, la, eh, en, la, en el conflicto de Argelia del ejército francés. Eh, esta asamblea, digamos, fue atacada por un grupo de la extrema derecha francesa, con bombas eh, granadas lacrimógenas y ¿verdad? entonces se forzó una salida eh, en masa, digamos, de los asistentes a esta asamblea a la calle y un enfrentamiento durísimo con la policía eh, francesa que dejó aproximadamente 65 muertos entre los asistentes a, la, eh, a esta eh, asamblea y 25 entre los policías franceses. Bien. At first, my aim today was to introduce Girard in the debate and the conversation around terrorism in the Basque country, which is related to nationalism ideologically. Uh, during the last centuries, 80s and 90s, the terrorist group ETA was very active in Spain. As you know, it only finished, stopped all operations a few years ago. However, it did last for half a century, from, actually from 1968 until very recently. This terrorist group, this terrorist conflict, introduced Spain into a spiral of violence and it did not stop at all after Franco, the dictator's death. We must think, how did it happen? What happened? Why did it happen? How did terrorism restarted as a phenomenon in, uh, in Europe after Second World War? There is a key date and this is 27th of October 1960, when the, Fre the National French Students' Union were having a meeting, a gathering at the Salle de la Mutualité in Paris. They were holding an assembly on the intervention by Argez in Argelia. 
Then they were attacked by a group of right-wing extremists that used tear gas amongst other weapons. The leftist students left the building, went up to the streets, and there took place a very violent fight against the police that left 65 victims amongst the students and 25 amongst the policemen. Lo importante en este, eh, en este primer retorno de la violencia política, digamos, a la Europa Occidental, eh, es que eh, las eh, dos fuerzas que se enfrentaron, eh, no en la Plaza de la República, eh, con, los, eh, digamos, con la policía francesa, con las compañías nacionales de, de seguridad, sino en el ámbito de la eh, sala de la mutualité, es decir, la extrema izquierda y la extrema derecha francesa, ambas reclamaron eh, en los días sucesivos la herencia de la resistencia francesa frente al nazismo. Es decir, tanto la, eh, un, eh, extrema, la extrema derecha, que en esos momentos tenía como referencia a la OAS, ¿eh? a la Organización Armada Secreta Francesa, como eh, la Unión de Estudiantes, eh, la Unión Nacional de Estudiantes Franceses, con una mayoría comunista, digamos, ambas reclamaron la herencia de la resistencia francesa, de la resistencia francesa. Eh, es decir, el enfrentamiento eh, de, lo, de la extrema izquierda francesa con la policía tuvo, digamos, <coughs> un mediador en el sentido girardiano que fue la extrema derecha en, en esos momentos. Algo parecido había sucedido, digamos, en la fase eh, republicana española, digamos, en los años, entre los años 35 y 36, digamos, en los enfrentamientos entre la extrema derecha y la extrema izquierda, ambos, digamos, eh, eh, opuestos, digamos, al, eh, al gobierno republicano como tal, eh, también se había producido un fenómeno de mediación de este tipo. Eh, ambos eh, pretendían representar, diríamos, al pueblo, no a la resistencia en esos momentos. El concepto de resistencia aparecerá y será fundamental, digamos, en eh, la violencia política de la posguerra, de, de, esos, eh, de esos años de la posguerra, dentro de los 30 gloriosos, ¿no? digamos. Eh, ese retorno de la, eh, de, la, de la violencia tuvo una importancia fundamental dentro del de País Vasco, dentro de España, eh, por razones en las que ahora sería eh, muy eh, prolijo, digamos, eh, adentrarnos. Eh, se produce, digamos, en los años 60, la aparición de un terrorismo nacionalista, digamos, en, en el País Vasco, eh, que mm, trata de aplicar, digamos, también una eh, estrategia, eh, una estrategia mimética, ¿eh? una estrategia mimética eh, frente, digamos, al, eh, al Estado español y frente al, a la, al gobierno franquista, digamos. ¿eh? Esa estrategia se definió en los, en los años 60 como la estrategia de la espiral acción-represión. Y tiene bastante que ver con la racionalización, diríamos, eh, eh, revolucionaria de este retorno espectacular de la, de la violencia en los años eh, en los, eh, Europa Occidental y también después, digamos, a las eh, universidades americanas en, en, el contexto, en este contexto de los años, de los años 60. Eh, sí. I was referring to uh, violence in France, but not that uh, that took place at the Place de la République, precisely that that I just mentioned that took place outside the Salle de la Mutualité between the police and the students. This was the case of a group of extreme right-wing students and extreme left-wing students who both, in this period of time, would claim to be the 
heirs of the resistance uh, France, the French resi resistance. Um, in particular, the right-winged uh, groups were uh, organized around the OAS, the Armed Organization of the French Security, and the Student Union, in the case of the leftists, who were mostly communists. Both of these groups tried to appropriate the meaning of the resistance for themselves. And there was actually a mediator dynamic, a, a dynamic that would involve the figure of the mediator in these leftists versus right-wing students uh, conflict. Something very similar happened in Spain at the time of the Republic, between the years 35 and 36. There was a struggle between extremists from both ends of the political spectrum. We often, and, and also this appropriation of the resistance had something to do with the entire conflict, what we have called the Glorious Thirty. All these um, dynamics and this comeback of violence to the Western world had a huge impact in Spain, in particular in the Basque country. In the 60s, the Basque country saw the rise of a nationalist terrorist group, and they applied a magnetic strategy. They used this strategy to fight the Spanish government in Franco, the dictator. This dynamic has been coined the spiral action slash repression. It was an attempt to somehow rationalize the combat of violence in the Western world after the Second World War. Well, Franco's government was a form of a dictatorship, hmm? as, you, as you know. But uh, the problem was uh, how to present, uh, how to uh, uh, define uh, a democratic uh, uh, government like a French uh, government in that, in that moment, or uh, the government of the United States as a dictatorship, a form of dictatorship. You will uh, remember uh, the one book of, um, one uh, essay of uh, Herbert Marcuse about the repressive tolerance. Hmm? Bien, voy a seguir en, en español. De hecho, eh, digamos, la idea fundamental de Marcus en este ensayo es que eh, estos gobiernos democráticos solo son aparentemente democráticos. En realidad son dictaduras latentes, dictaduras solapadas, y basta solamente, digamos, con eh, eh, provocarlas eh, o eh, irrumpir eh, políticamente más allá de los límites permitidos para que estos estados, eh, aparentemente democráticos, manifiesten su condición de dictadura. Bien. Esta eh, idea de la tolerancia represiva está en el fondo también de las estrategias adoptadas en el País Vasco por el nuevo nacionalismo terrorista, por el nuevo terrorismo nacionalista de ETA. Eh, a través de la llamada espiral de acción-represión. La espiral de acción-represión consiste en una provocación escalonada, digamos, al, al Estado para provocar, digamos, una eh, reacción cada vez, digamos, más dura, más represiva y más violenta por parte del Estado. Es decir, una acción determinada provoca, digamos, una represión eh, de un grado, digamos, exponencialmente diferente de la, eh, de la violencia infligida, digamos, al Estado. A continuación, esto eh, permite, digamos, una intensificación de la violencia resistencial, el Estado contesta con una violencia mayor, y esto, digamos, dentro de la estrategia del nuevo terrorismo nacionalista, implicaría una incorporación eh, eh, gradual también, pero también exponencialmente eh, exponencialmente creciente de las masas ¿eh? 
de, las, eh, eh, de la población vasca en este caso, digamos, a la lucha contra el, eh, contra el franquismo. ¿Mm? Bien, esta fue la estrategia dominante en los años eh, 60, durante los años 60, y sobre todo después de las primeras acciones eh, con atentados letales de ETA, digamos, en el año 68 hasta la muerte de Franco, hasta el año 65. ¿Mm? La eh, espiral funcionó, ¿Mm? funcionó, digamos, la represión se intensificó, que era lo que se, lo que se pretendía. Además, hay que tener en cuenta que efectivamente el, eh, el gobierno franquista, digamos, era, era una dictadura. Eh, una dictadura que obviamente fue, digamos, provocada por Poleta a desarrollar una violencia a la que muy gustosamente habría renunciado, digamos, sobre todo porque el contexto europeo en esos momentos no eh, era, eh, digamos, eh, receptivo, digamos, a este tipo de a este tipo de actitudes por parte de, de por parte del régimen franquista. Bien, esto se intensificó, como digo, hasta la muerte de Franco, hasta el año 75. Eh, se suponía, digamos, que a partir de ese momento, digamos, una vez caída la dictadura, ETA, el, el terrorismo vasco que luchaba en teoría contra una dictadura, iba a dejar de actuar, pero no lo hizo. Siguió adelante, digamos, con, eh, una, con esta escalada de violencia dentro de la nueva fase democrática. Entonces, I referred to Marcus's essay, Repressive Tolerance. By repressive tolerance, Marcus means democracies that are actually dictatorships in disguise. At the slightest provocation, they show their true colors. This idea of the repressive tolerance was, or repressive tolerance was used to inform the strategy the nationalist terrorist group in the Basque country would use, this action slash repression strategy. So the idea was to provoke the Spanish government in an escalated fashion so that the government in turn would turn more and more repressive each time. It did happen, they did intensify resistance so that the government did intensify the repression. It also implied, in the case of the Basque Country, a growing engagement from the civil population at the Basque Country against the Frankist dictatorship. This uh, took uh, place primarily during the 60s, and of course it was made evident in 1968 when uh, the terrorist group did a lethal, completely, <clears throat> absolutely violent and um, cruel attack uh, in the to the Spanish population. And this went on and on until uh, the year where the dictatorship ended, when Franco died. Of course, they, asked, they responded from the government with violence, with repression, because this was a dictatorship. But probably Franco or, and Franco's government didn't want to use the violence. They felt forced into using it somehow because it was quite tricky politically to use violence at this time. Any violent action on the side of the Spanish government would have been frowned upon by uh, Europe. He, it would have left his government in quite a delicate position. Franco died in uh, year 75, and um, did violence stop? No, it didn't. In that new context, after the Franco's death, eh, algunos eh, antiguos miembros eh, de eh, ETA, de la ETA, eh, de esta organización nacionalista terrorista durante la época franquista, descubrimos la eh, obra de Gillard. ¿Mm? Eh, fue en el año 79 y de una forma bastante eh, casual, aleatoria e imprevista. Eh, yo encontré, digamos, las conversaciones de Girard con eh, la edición de Brasset de, eh, de esos caixes de Puy, la Fundación de Mont, de, de, eh, del 79, ese mismo año encontré el libro de Girard en una librería de, de Bilbao. 
Lo comenté, digamos, con algunos eh, de mis amigos, ya no estábamos en ETA, obviamente, eh, pero participamos en eh, algunas de las nuevas eh, eh, formaciones políticas de la, de la democracia y intentamos, digamos, eh, intentamos explicarnos qué había sucedido, por qué, digamos, esta continuidad de, de ETA y de la violencia terrorista después de la muerte de Franco, incluso cómo había surgido esa violencia terrorista. Eh, y eh, el pensamiento de Girard, digamos, fue definitivo, en nuestro caso, digamos, para eh, este, eh, esta revisión y, digamos, y este ajuste de cuentas con nuestro propio pasado. De ahí, digamos, que durante los años eh, 80 y 90, sobre todo, digamos, en el, en el País Vasco, eh, la nueva literatura crítica con, eh, con el nacionalismo vasco y con ETA esté llena de referencias a, a Girard. ¿Mm? At a certain point in time, ancient it TA members like myself found out about Girard. It was usually by chance that this happened. In my own particular case, I came up with, I ran into Grasset's edition of Choses Cachées depuis la Fondation du Monde, the one from 1979, in a bookstore at Bilbao. I bought it, and when I started having conversations with my friends, with former members of the terrorist group, and discussions uh, around Girard's thinks, thinking, uh, we were, most of us, were members of the new parties that had been formed in the new political arena in Spain. And we were wondering how did it happen Why was this terrorist group doing what they were doing in Spain? And Girard became key to our understanding of our past, to this revisiting our past. In the 80s and 90s, most literature in the Basque country that's critical, that takes a critical approach to Basque's nationalism, or ETA, the terrorist group, references Girard constantly. Yes. Um, fundamentalmente, hubo tres eh, aplicaciones teóricas de, de la obra de, del pensamiento de Girard al análisis de la situación en esos años 80 y 90, digamos, en el País Vasco, la continuidad de la violencia terrorista, fundamentalmente. Eh, una de ellas, voy a resumirlas muy brevemente y con esto terminaré, eh, una de ellas representada fundamentalmente por una organización eh, que procedía de ETA, pero que había obviamente eh, aceptado la, la democracia, los términos de la, de la democracia y que había abandonado toda eh, oposición, digamos, armada al al, eh, al, nuevo, al nuevo régimen del principio la organización se llama Euskadi Coesquerra ¿sí? eh, es decir la izquierda de Euskadi o la izquierda de, de eh, left wing of the past country ¿sí? eh, y que terminó digamos formando parte del partido socialista ¿sí? del partido socialista obrero español eh, desde Euskadi Coesquerra lo que eh, se interpretó, digamos, a partir de, de, de la lectura de la obra de Girard, es que la violencia terrorista era una violencia entre iguales. ¿Sí? Era una violencia que enfrentaba fundamentalmente a vascos contra vascos. Vascos que no aceptaban, digamos, la salida democrática y, por lo tanto, la nueva configuración de eh, un eh, Estado democrático español y que perseguían la independencia todavía frente a vascos, digamos, que aceptaban, digamos, la, eh, esta condición, eh, esta nueva condición de ciudadanos de un Estado democrático español. Una violencia entre iguales, por tanto, eh, cuyo, eh, digamos, eh, objeto común disputado, digamos, era obviamente la propia Euskadi, el propio País Vasco. ¿Mm? Bien, 
Eh, esta posición en la que bueno, se colocaron inmediatamente la mayor parte de los, de los antiguos militantes de ETA de, de, este, de esta organización de Euskadi Coesquerra, representada fundamentalmente por su, eh, por su secretario general, que era además un escritor y un teórico político, Mario Naindía, eh, se eh, acabó eh, situando una especie de postura angélica entre la violencia del Estado y la violencia de ETA, repartiendo en ese sentido excomuniones a diestro y siniestro y considerándose no implicada en la, eh, en la nueva situación eh, que enfrentaba a ETA con el Estado eh, de Derecho Español, con el nuevo Estado de Derecho Español, aparecido después de la muerte de Franco. Es decir, es una eh, posición que se agotó pronto, inmediatamente después de la entrada de eh, Euskadi Esquerra dentro del Partido Socialista ya en los años 90, comienzos de los años 90. Pero, digamos, el, eh, esta utilización de Girard eh, por parte de, de esta, eh, estos antiguos militantes de ETA, y, y, esto, integrados en este, en este partido, se... Eh, prolongó a lo largo de los, de los años 80, hasta el final, y dejó un buen eh, número de textos eh, detrás. ¿Mm? De ellos. ¿Puedes? There are mainly three theoretical applications of Chiragian thoughts to the Basque conflict. The first of all has to do with a newly formed organization that uh, was configured after the death of Franco and whose members derived from ETA, the terrorist group, but were willing to accept the new democratic terms and they refused any armed opposition to the new government. This group was called Euskadi Go Esquerra and it is formed by leftists in the Basque country that were later on incorporated into the Spanish Socialist Party. Their thoughts uh, with the members of this group thought that Basque country's violence had been a violence amongst equals. This was their main idea. And thus, it was a violence that had Basque people at the end of the spectrum and Basque people at the other end. But it divided Basque society into two distinct groups that formed by those who did not accept the status quo that had been created after Franco's death, and the new Democrats, the new democracy, and those who didn't, and those who did. <laughs> um, and of course, Euskadi, the Basque country, was both groups' object of desire. Mario Mendia was uh, this party's general secretary. And um, at the end of the day, the whole discourse was based on the idea that they were somehow self-righteous and they would criticize both the terrorists' violence and Franco's violence, the dictatorship's violence, and they wouldn't criticize issues that had to do with the new Democrats, the new democracy that was actually going on in Spain at the time of their formation. This last, didn't last very long, only until the 90s when they were incorporated into the Socialist Party. But in any case, Girardian thought informed many of their approaches and ideas, and you can find many texts uh, from the 80s written by people in this party who take on some of Girard's ideas. La segunda posición o la segunda interpretación de Girard eh, estuvo representada durante esos años y durante los 90, en este caso también, 
por, eh, digamos, un antropólogo eh, vasco de la Universidad eh, eh, de la Universidad de la UNED, de la Universidad a distancia brileña, Juan Aranzadi, que fue de hecho, digamos, el primero que yo recuerde en citar explícitamente a Girard en, a René Girard en, un, eh, en uno de sus libros de 1981, un libro sobre eh, la, eh, el milenarismo vasco, ¿eh? era su título, sobre la violencia eh, eh, nacionalista y la etnicidad. Eh, lo que Aranzadi sostenía es que eh, el conflicto mimético se daba entre un Estado, eh, un nuevo Estado que pretendía, digamos, eh, ser democrático, pero que en realidad no lo era, eh, y que era más bien el resultado de una transacción entre las formas dictatoriales y eh, las formas democráticas. Una idea, por supuesto, que en estos momentos así está siendo recogida por la, por la extrema izquierda, por la nueva extrema izquierda eh, española, y eh, por el nacionalismo vasco radical. ¿eh? El nacionalismo vasco radical que no aceptaba esa nueva situación. Eh, en, esta, en, en este enfrentamiento, el eh, chivo expiatorio, el chivo emisario, en, en opinión de Aranzadi, era inevitablemente la, eh, eh, las fuerzas de seguridad, eh, fundamentalmente, digamos, la policía, eh, el ejército, la guardia civil, etc. Este eh, esquema de, de Aranzadi... Eh, no preveía, digamos, una uh, posible solución al conflicto y pronosticaba, digamos, una continua, uh, un continuo crecimiento de la, de la violencia. I'm going to introduce you now, to you now, the second interpretation of Girardian thought. In the 90s, uh, there was a Basque anthropologist based at the UNED, a Spanish university, who was called Juan Aranzade. Aranzadi. 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 He was the first, as far as I know, to quote Girard, and he did so in 1981. He uh, quoted Girard while he was discussing Basque's millennialism ethnicity and nationalist violence. The author thought that in this particular historic case, magnetic violence was taking place between the following two parties. On the one side, a new state that was supposedly democratic, but which was just the result of a compromise that had been reached between the dictatorship and democratic ideas. Of course, this idea that uh, this uh, democratic governments or, or systems are actually dictatorships in disguise has been re re um, revisited by the new left in Spain. And uh, in recent years, it's become more and more common to listen to this kind of thing. In any case, on the other side of the violence, there was the Basque nationalist movement. In this case, the scapegoat were the armed forces in, according, in accordance with the, these thinkers' ideas. By armed forces, he meant policemen, civil guards, and the army. The author did not foresee a a pacific end to violence, he thought it would go on and on in the future. Well, eh, voy terminando. En mi caso, eh, a mi juicio, eh, si había un conflicto mimético en, en el País Vasco de esos años, o en España, era un conflicto que se daba directamente entre ETA y el Estado de Derecho. ETA imitaba al Estado. ETA se constituía en una especie de doble diabólico del Estado, con estúpidos y sangrientos aparatitos burocráticos y paramilitares, y hasta con su hacienda revolucionaria, 
¿eh? perceptora de un impuesto revolucionario, digamos, eh, y de, mediante extorsiones a los, a los empresarios, etcétera, pero con eh, la pretensión de ser, digamos, una especie de doble especular, digamos, del, del Estado de Derecho. El hecho de que la rivalidad mimética, a mi juicio, enfrentase al Estado y a una banda terrorista que se autoconstituía, digamos, en doble del Estado, evitó que el enfrentamiento armado se extendiera a la sociedad, llamémosla civil. Es decir, evitó un enfrentamiento directo entre los vascos nacionalistas y los no nacionalistas. Al contrario que en Irlanda del Norte, por ejemplo, no hubo en el País Vasco una guerra civil entre dos comunidades. Que el Estado podía ceder a la tentación de imitar a ETA fue algo que no tardó en demostrarse con los llamados grupos de eh, los GAL, los eh, grupos eh, de liberación. De un grupo contraterrorista montado desde, desde el Estado. Pero la ausencia de violencia intercomunitaria impidió que el contagio mimético desembocase en una situación de indiferenciación social y de violencia general, generalizada que hiciera a su vez inevitable la aparición de un chivo expiatorio. Pero si alguna vez esa situación llegara a darse, yo sostuve, sostenía, que los antiguos etarras pasados a la democracia y a la defensa de la Constitución, tendrían o tendríamos grandes posibilidades de ocupar ese papel, el de la víctima propiciatoria o el chivo emisario, porque no sería difícil endosarnos, digamos, la responsabilidad del origen del conflicto. Pero que había también la posibilidad de que no se alcanzase, digamos, ese estado jovesiano de la guerra generalizada del todos contra todos, de caos violento, y por eso consideraba prematuro y absurdo, pero sobre todo peligroso, andar intentando localizar en la situación de entonces, digamos, un chivo expiatorio. Con esto, eh, yo creo que pueden tener, no sé si una idea un poco confusa todavía, de cómo se aplicó Girard en el conflicto, diríamos, en el conflicto violento en el, en el País Vasco desde los años 80 en adelante. This is the last part of my intervention. Violence in the Basque Country was between this terrorist group and the, um, le, the democratic government. But what happened was that um, ETA, the terrorist group, started somehow imitating the democratic government. State. So state, sorry state so that it became some sort of evil double of the state. They had their own taxes in place, they had their own administrative system, they mimicked the structure of the state. The tax system of course was despicable because they would exert violence on businessmen and people in general to get money for their organization. But in any case, uh, they, they were mimicking the state, and the state, in turn, did mimic the terrorist group, which was uh, made evident when they created the GAL, G-A-L. This is violent groups in the state, from the forces of the state, that were violently fighting um, terrorist groups. But the fact that this dichotomy between the state and the terrorist group meeting each other prevented violence to become contagious in the, within the civil society. Unlike the case of Northern Ireland, the people in the Basque Country did not become violent to one another Uh, or divided into two violent groups, those who were nationalists and those who were not. Uh, 
so it didn't end up in a civil war. Since there was no final crisis of indifferentiation and violence was not generalized amongst the general population, there was no need for an actual scapegoat in the end. However, I think if, if there had been the need for one, it would have probably been those of us who had been part of the terrorist group and had left it behind to embrace democracy. I'm sure we would have been the preferred scapegoats in such situation, because it was really easy to put the blame on us. In any case, uh, I just wanted to let you know how Girardian thinking was applied in uh, literature uh, dealing with the conflict in the Basque Country that took place during the 80s in Spain. Thank you very much. An invitation to join this seminar on identity and rivalry. Work of a reflection was that Okay. Thank you very much again for your very kind invitation to join this seminar on identity and rivalry in the general framework of our uh, reflection of violence and religion and with the permanent reference of the French philosopher René Girard. First of all, I would like to say that I'm not a philosopher, a theologian, a theologian or an anthropologist. I come from the other side of the street although I'm an historian by training for the past uh, 30 years. I have, I have been working as a specialist and consultant in international security. My perspective is more practical than theoretical, and it's from this perspective I'm going to present and to share with all of you a few ideas and reflection. Well, you know, religion is a core element of our culture. Since the beginning of the times, every single group of sapiens around the world has tried to get answers to the same basic question of light. Why are we here? Who, whom, or what has created the world? Why he, they, or it has done it? Does our person in this world make any sense? Do our lives have, have any transcendental dimension? <coughs> well, every group has established in a, a dynamic mode a set of ideas to answer to uh, these worries. These ideas have played a key role in the development of our culture. Every culture, a set of uh, values and principles on many fundamental questions, and the use of force and the ethic of violence are not an exception. During the long decades of the Cold War, many political disputes were put aside because of the fear of a nuclear holocaust. The chilling effect disappeared after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The old ghosts left the wardrobe of history and reappeared with a renewed vigor. Nationalism is one of these ghosts, one of the worst, responsible for most of the disaster that characterized the fateful 20th century in Europe. To understand the growth of nationalism nowadays, we must consider one of the key features of the international arena in the transition between the 20th and 21st centuries. The end of the primacy of the state as it was established in the framework on the treaties of Westphalia. The state is not the actor anymore. It's just an actor, one of them. This new status is the consequence of new realities. Firstly, the socialization of politics. Nowadays, people have the tools they require to assume a very much active role in the debate and the resolution of social issues. Secondly, the globalization is today a reality thanks to more effective communication networks. 
ideas, person, news, goods, everything can travel from one point to the other of our planet in a very speed mode. Thirdly, people matter. There is a growing global public opinion, and this is an evident, evident fact in the Western world particularly. In Europe, we are in the middle of a process to create a new form of superstate. The future is, of course, uncertain, but the present is not as encouraging as we would like it. Thousands of Europeans faced with immigration, social and economic challenges originated by the fourth industrial revolution and with the general process of globalization are worried about the future of their identity. While the citizens dispute over these <coughs> issues, the Lanchet process casts serious doubts on the role of the state in the 21st century. In a globalized world, the old European state has not the critical size to play a relevant role. If the state is weaker than before, who is taking up that political space? The answer was foreseen by Professor Huntington, cultural, cultures and religions. In Europe, we are in front of a spring of nationalism. In Great Britain, Belgium, Italy, Ukraine, and Spain, there are movements in favor of territorial independence. In other countries, nationalist parties are emerging against the European integration process. In the case of Spain, we see in Catalonia and the Basque Country an important part of the public opinion and political parties struggling for independence. It's our main domestic problem. They are not alone. There are independent movements in other uh, Spanish regions, but uh, uh, weaker. In these two regions, now autonomic regions, the nationalist culture were developed with an active role of religious authorities. This was not by chance, but a consequence of history. The origin of these political movements lies on the rejection of the consequence of the first industrial revolution, the rise of liberalism, the abolition of all laws and political tradition as a consequence of a political modernization, the end of guilds with the welfare institutions, the emergence of laicism in the towns transformed by the effect of the new industries and the arrival of new workers. The first industrial revolution was caused and consequence of a new era with new mentalities, challenges, and new political agenda. Then, as now, in the first hall of the fourth industrial revolution, there are people ready to stop the change and to fortify the old structures. Many priests were ahead of these groups from the intellectual, political, or military agenda, arena, sorry. They understood the responsibility of preserving the natural order with a strong compromise of the church. It was not the official position of the church, we, but we can't diminish the importance of this sector of the Catholic Church. They were the creators and the managers of the tradition in the core of the local or regional culture. The Carlismo, the contra-revolutionary movement, was defeated by the arms. The liberalism achieved to establish a new political order during the 19th century with the primacy of the parliament and the division of powers. The losers accepted part of the new era feature, but in some cases they rejected the new order. Although they accepted and developed the new industries, they claim all laws, administrative autonomy, primacy of their own language, and identity. If the old Carlistas were unequivocally Spaniards, the new nationalist movements vindicate the alterity. Carlistas and, national and nationalists have in common an anti-liberal attitude, 
underline the community's rights over the individual autonomy. Following René Girard, the nationalists have developed a mimetic behavior, growing up as time passes. They vindicate the right to be recognized as a nation, but rejected the idea that Spain is a proper nation. They argue that Castile, the, the, uh, the region in, in the center of the peninsula, imposes its vision over the rest of the peninsular countries and territories. The Catalanismo, the Catalan nationalism, is the legitimate political culture of this country, Catalonia. On the contrary, the Spanish nationalism is illegitimate because it implies an imposition to others. A nation is, of course, a subject of sovereignty in the European tradition, and consequently, they demand the right to proclaim the independence of Catalonia. Spain can live on without Catalonia, but just as a expression of the big Castile. After the liberation and the oppressed nation, Spain, in fact, the rest of the actual Spain, will be a proper nation and a proper state. This narrative is a permanent effort to avoid reality. In Catalonia or in the Basque Country, there is not a majority of uh, pro-independence. Thousands of Basques and Catalonians don't have any problem with the fact of being Spaniards. There is not a conflict of identity. They are feeling the conflict, because without conflict, it's not possible to advance towards the independence. It's the same mechanism that Al-Qaeda practiced in Europe, but without terrorism, in the case of Catalonia. They incite the animadversion against the Muslim population as a tool to disrupt its integration in the European societies. The terrorist attacks in Europe have different and complementary objectives. One of, this, one of them is to convince the Europeans that they can't trust Muslims. The Islam is incompatible with democracy. The Muslims are not ready to accept our values and principles. And by immigration and natural growth, they will conquer Europe and transform the old continent in Islam land. With more suspicion, less integration. With new anti-Muslim parties, more cohesion of this population, the Muslim population, around the imams, the imams, and more religious and cultural identity. Al-Qaeda is the expression of the Islamist anxiety over the impact of globalization in their societies. It's a proof of weakness. In the same way, Nationalism is the expression of the identity anxiety because the challenges of a new era or the ideological vacuum. The nationalist understands that without tension, it's not possible to advance toward its political goal because the people can live without problems in a cultural space with two languages. Diversity is a cultural wealth. It's an asset. The Catalonia or Basque cultural identities are perfectly compatible with the Kingdom of Spain or with the European Union. But it's naive to consider that a nationalist party can be a loyal partner in the pursuit of good governance. This is the division line between a regionalist and nationalist political party. Regionalist, nationalist. The first, the regionalists, defend the cultural identity as well as the Spanish unity. It's the case of Unión del Pueblo Navarro in Navarra, in the north of Spain, in the east of Basque Country, or in the case of Bavaria, the Social Christian Party. History matters, and in some European regions, the sensibility on history and tradition dictate that political parties follow a regionalist strategy. The second, the nationalists, assume the independent as conditio sine qua non to get a proper life, to be free. In its political imaginary, there is no liberty and no dignity without independence. It's a religious axioma. 
To increase tension is necessary to signal an aggressor, of course, the Kingdom of Spain. Spain. The second step is to define the nature of aggression, the Catalonia submission to the values, interests, laws, and leaders of Spain, the big Castile. As a consequence of this submission, part of the Catalonian resources is invested in other areas or wasted in a political operation. Catalonia can't be herself, can't uh, develop its own resources in clever, appropriate ways. The third is the dramatization of a political dialogue frustrated by the government's lack of political will. Catalonia or Basque country have more administrative competence than a German lamb in this particular moment, and sometimes uh, the term of the dialogue between the nationalists and the government are obviously unconstitutional. For this reason, it's not possible to advance. But there is no space uh, for reason of common sense. We have in front of axiomas, a new dogmas, political dogmas. Extra ecclesia nulla salus. You know the classical Catholic expression, outside the church there is no salvation. In the last centuries, we have seen a double phenomenon, the growing up of laicism, and at the same time, the emergence of political religions. With the Christian churches, sorry, while the Christian churches were losing influence in their societies, the parties assumed the role of ethnic and cultural dictators. People lost the faith by need rules and certitudes. Socialists, communists, fascists, and nationalists feel the necessity to establish a political correction, an ethic code to invade uh, the individual sphere and, as in the old world works, to define correctness and incorrectness. They take advantage of that unsatisfied demand. You can opt to be free, of course, to accommodate your behavior uh, with your thinking, but the price is the salvation. In this case, the salvation on earth. Extra political correctness nulla salus. Outside the political correction, you will be a paria. Your friends will leave you progressively, your professional aspiration can be frustrated, you will feel isolated, and at the end, you will consider to move another region. Ancha es Castilla, how white Castile is, a prominent nationalist said, inviting to leave the Basque country to those unhappy with the hegemony of the nationalist culture. Violence doesn't need the use of force. It's not something new, <laughs> and we can remember many cases in our history. Relativism is the philosophy of our time. The Western world recognized the extreme difficulty to answer the original question. Why are we here? Who, who, nor what created the world? Why he, they, or it do it? Has any sin our person in this world? Are there any transcendental dimension of our lives? The science opened our eyes to a reality very much complex our grandfathers imagined. And the message received in the school or in the church looked too basic. If there is no transcendence, if the life is just a short and insignificant episode in the magnitude of this universe, we try to accommodate our existence to the environment and the price of part of our liberty can be considered cheap. Without hope, comfort is an acceptable life goal. Without hope, my convenience gave relevance in my conscience. If we need moral and social rules, why don't accept the nationalist ones? They are rooted in history and culture, as the local priests and historian remember us. We can't understand the emergence of political religion without considering the Catholic cultural heritage. People can lose faith, but they need charge. Parties with authoritarian vocation are ready to occupy the space 
lost by church and to promote a coherent and comprehensive vision of life in history, in society, sorry. Perhaps the life has not sent, but meanwhile, you can be relatively happy if you accept to be a good parishioner of the new religions, the religions without God, but the religions with identity. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Some questions? <laughs> What's the problem only <laughs> last Pedro, night? <laughs> excuse me. Only Pedro works about identity, national identity, and nationalist identity in Spain. Uh, the um, foundations of the uh, uh, Basque nationalism uh, were, um, uh, in the first moment, the race uh, and, uh, uh, and the language, and the Basque language, but uh, uh, with time, uh, along the well, along the, uh, the 20th century, uh, that foundation were uh, 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 losing, mm? uh, and uh, then the only uh, uh, identity, the only um, uh, characteristic of the uh, Basque identity, was the opposition and the violence against Spain. Hmm? was a reactive identity because uh, the Basque language uh, is um, uh, the language of only a minority uh, within the, the Basque country within the, the and the race is uh, assured hmm? in that, uh, yeah. but uh, the uh, curious evolution of uh, Basque uh, question, the Basque problem in, in Spain, uh, has been uh, uh, very uh, amusing, uh, um, uh, amusing um, evolution. Uh, at this, in this moment, uh, the Basque nationalism defines uh, Basque, uh, uh, Basque people or Basque uh, uh, essence. essence like a uh, uh, nation foral. Nation foral is privileged nation. Uh, this is an uh, absurd uh, 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 sentence or phrase uh, because uh, nation and privilege are uh, um, contrary in the uh, contrary concepts. Uh, the only form of uh, to understand understanding this uh, definition is uh, uh, thinking is that a uh, Basque country is the f privileged part of Spain. It's, uh, uh, the uh, privileged uh, uh, Spaniards. Basque are the uh, Spaniards with privilege. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in this moment, uh, this is the uh, official definition of uh, nationalism. Uh, is uh, different from uh, the, the case of uh, Catalan uh, Catalonian uh, nationalism in this moment. Catalonian nationalism is uh, a uh, nationalism against Spain. The first phase of the Basque uh, nationalism. Hmm? Yeah. Now, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you both. I was extremely impressed by the lectures, and I have a remark and a question from John Juaristi. Mm -hmm. Sh shall I make the question in English? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was utterly impressed by how powerful was your reading of Marcuse and Jihar, mm -hmm. and how timely, because Marcuse's essay is 1965, yeah. and uh, Jihar's book is 1978. So almost immediately, the reading of Marcuse and Jihar had a very different, almost opposite effect. But the important thing is how powerful it was, how the philosophical insights actually mm -hmm. prompted political action. 
So I was very much impressed by this almost synchronicity be, uh, regarding Marcuse and the Jihar in your political action. However, I didn't have a question. I was really impressed by I think that I have never imagined that the Jihar's idea could have such a strong practical, political, immediate impact. So I thank you tremendously for this insight. Mm -hmm. The question is the curiosity. At this time in Europe, urban guerrilla was very important in Italy, in Germany, in several places. But actually, it was not easy, the situa situationism in France and so forth and so on. But it was not easy to develop a strategy to have a guerrilla in urban centers, especially in Europe. So did you, how was your reading? Did you have any sort of a philosophical background or specific readings for the development of urban guerrilla as well? Because I, I, I'm familiar with the case of uh, the Brigate Rosse, the Bader Meinhof, the Situationism, and they have a very specific philosophical uh, background for that specific kind of action as well. Um, uh, yo supongo que en, en eh, tanto Marcus como como Girard, eh, aunque están dentro de la misma problemática, están en contextos epistemológicos diferentes. ¿eh? Eh, Girar en el contexto del estructuralismo, las ciencias del hombre, es decir, el diálogo de, de Girar o el, el debate de Girar es más bien con Claude Levi Strauss, con eh, la antropología estructuralista, etcétera, con y la epistemología estructuralista. ¿Mm? Mientras que eh, Marcus está eh, dentro del eh, eh, marxismo, eh, la escuela de Frankfurt, eh, el, eh, el, el, el marxismo trasladado, transferido, digamos, a a los Estados Unidos. Um, la um, influencia de Marcus en los distintos grupos eh, terroristas, digamos, en, en la década de los 60 y de los 70 fue desigual. De hecho, digamos, sí la tuvo en, los, uh, en las eh, Brigadas Rojas, ¿eh? en las eh, en, eh, en, en, en las... Eh, en, eh, y, y lo tuvo desde luego, lo tuvo, digamos, en España, en, eh, en la extrema izquierda española y en ETA, digamos, a través de esta idea de la tolerancia represiva relacionada con el, eh, la espiral acción-represión, con la espiral acción-represión. Eh, en parte, digamos, esto llegaba directamente a través de, de, de Marcus y de las obras de Marcus y de la tolerancia represiva, el ensayo sobre la tolerancia represiva, pero también sobre las ciertas aplicaciones de esta idea de tolerancia represiva en, las, en la guerrilla latinoamericana, ¿eh? y fundamentalmente en Brasil. Fundamentalmente en Brasil. Helder Cámara se refirió varias veces a la espiral de acción represión en aquella, en aquella época como una fórmula, digamos, del, del, nuevo, del nuevo marxismo. ¿no? En, en las, eh, es decir, la acción represión consiste fundamentalmente en terminar, digamos, con la uh, fachada democrática del, del Estado a base de desarrollar contra él, digamos, una provocación intensa. ¿no? Yeah, okay, no problem. As far as Marcus's influence in different terrorist groups in, in Europe, there are uh, different cases for different groups. Um, well, let me start by stating that I think Girard and Marcus operated in completely different contexts. The, um, the thoughts of Girard emerge mainly from human sciences, and his dialogue is with authors such as Lévi Strauss, the structuralists in France, and uh, structural epidemiology. Whilst uh, Marcus was um, engaging with Marxism, the School of Frankfurt, and in general Marxism in the context of the United States. So as I said, in the 60s, Marcus has uh, had a, a very different influence or degree of influence depending on the terrorist group. 
I do think he influenced uh, Brigada Rosa and, of course, the extreme left in Spain. Right uh, in front, in the, um, the German terrorism is uh, not only the German terrorism, uh, the students' movement in Germany in the years, in the 60s, was very receptive to Marcuse's ideas. And where uh, Marcuse was German. In, uh, Rudy Dutch, uh, the student's uh, leadership in that moment was uh, Marcusian. Marcusian. Okay. So in, in Spain as well, of, of course, the ETA, uh, particularly with this idea that I already mentioned, the tolerant repression and the action repression spiral. The leftists in Spain at the time were interested in um, Marcus's essay, but had also looked at different applications of Marcusian theories uh, in practice, such as the ones in Latin American guerrillas in Brazil in particular. Elbert Elder Camara, the Elder Camara, the Bishop, or Elder Camara, Elder Camara, said that understood this action repression spiral as a, like a new, uh, new form of Marxism. As a new form of Marxism, yes. So it was like a new form of Marxism in this case. I have also a question to you. Uh, also, what you said was very convincing, but I, I fear I have not grasped really why you think that the mimetic rivalry between ETA and the Spanish state prevented the Basque land from slipping into a violence of all against all. Um, was this a kind of alienation of the conflict from the common people, or how can I understand this interpretation? No, um um problem is that ETA se presentó in todo momento, desde su origen mismo, como una alternativa al Estado, al Estado español. Digamos, ETA era un embrión de Estado desde, desde su origen. Primero porque ETA pre pretendía representar a toda la comunidad nacionalista vasca frente al viejo nacionalismo, pacifista, católico, etc., ETA aparece en los años 60 como, digamos, un nuevo nacionalismo eh, secular, secular nationalism, de, de traditional Basque nationalism is Catholic. ETA was Catholic. Eh? ETA, eh, from the first moment, is... Uh, eh, Secular movement, secular movement, y eh, sobre una nueva base identitaria. Sobre, eh, eh, ETA propone una nueva fundación del Basque nacionalismo. De eh, eh, only eh, Basque eh, possible identity was the fight against Spain, against Spain. Then uh, there wasn't a other uh, other way uh, to be nationalist uh, from the uh, after that, uh, uh, and then the this was uh, uh, Juan Aranzadi says uh, said uh, 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 um, uh, phrases las 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 balas de la Eh, para Bailun 9 tienen más que ver con la identidad vasca que las bellotas del árbol de Guernica. ¿Mm? No sé cómo traducir esto. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, the munition of the uh, uh, para Bailun 9 has uh, more to do with Basque identity than the uh, nuts. nuts of the, uh, uh, of the oak of Guernica. ¿Mm? Then the identity of uh, the, uh, the Basque uh, nation after that was violence against Spain. In the, 
en un sentido, digamos, esto favorece la incorporación de los eh, inmigrantes, digamos, al nacionalismo vasco. In the traditional nationalism, Basque nationalism, the immigrants couldn't eh, be part of the Basque country because we were Spaniards. But if an immigrant fights against Spain, from the point of view of ETA, is a Basque. Is more Basque than a native Basque who consider himself Spain, the Spaniards. Um, este, eh, este cambio es fundamental. Este cambio es fundamental porque eh, eh, plantea digamos, un eh, conflicto irresoluble. No se puede <risa> solucionar el conflicto. El conflicto debe ser permanente. No hay forma de terminar con el conflicto porque el conflicto, la lucha contra España es lo que proporciona, digamos, identidad al pueblo vasco, según ETA. ¿Mm? Pues, sí, si se termina la guerra contra España, se acabó el pueblo vasco. Este es el problema. Por tanto, digamos, la eh, concepción de eh, el conflicto con, eh, con España, con la, de la guerra contra España, desde la parte de ETA, es que es una guerra infinita. El concepto de guerra infinita eh, ...aparece en el pensamiento contemporáneo europeo... ...en un curso de Michel Foucault de 1976 en el Collège de France... ...donde Foucault en eh, un texto, bueno, en un curso que después... Uh, ...se publicará como For il defendre la société... ¿eh? ...hace falta defender la sociedad... ...defenderá la idea de que eh, la política... ...es la guerra por otros medios... ...invirtiendo, digamos, el aforismo de Clausewitz. Esto, en el caso de ETA... ...era eh, fundamental... ...es decir, la, la guerra es... ...una guerra inacabable. Yo supongo que lo sigue siendo todavía... ...en los herederos de ETA... ...o sea, que piensan... ...que la verdadera identidad vasca... ...está en la negación radical... ...de... Eh, digamos, todo posible acuerdo con España. España proporciona a los vascos la identidad como el enemigo. El enemigo define eh, la identidad vasca. De la misma forma que Sartre hablaba de la mirada del antisemita definiendo al judío, digamos, en el caso eh, del nacionalismo vasco, sería, eh, digamos, España la que define, la, que define a la identidad vasca. Como, digamos, lo inasimilable, lo, eh, el enemigo el enemigo perpetuo. From the very beginning, ETA presented themselves as a valid alternative to the state. They presented themselves as a state in the state of a sprout, as a seed that could eventually become a state proper. Also, ETA tried to gather the entire nationalist population, whereas in the past there had been division at the core of nationalism in the Basque Country. There were the Catholics, there were, there were different groups within nationalism. ETA from the very beginning um, established itself as a secular group that wasn't Catholic. Traditionally, nationalism in the Basque Country had been Catholic. So there was this new identity to be created. And they created this new nationalist identity by defining what being Basque meant as fighting Spain. He who fights Spain, he or she who fights Spain. It was the only way to become a true Basque person, a true Basque people. Y Aran, Aranzadi, the author that I already mentioned, used this uh, aphorism um, about the Guernica tree, etc., that was already brought to the table. Uh, 
in a way, this idea that fighting was the, the true, the making of the true identity, facilitates that immigrants join nationalism finally because they had been excluded from nationalism in the past. Immigrants, as in Spaniards, who had moved to the Basque country. As long as they fight Spain, they are Basque. Can That's the prerogative. Basque, can Basque they can be even Basque than the Basque by being violent. So they gain, they achieve a new identity, a new Basque identity by fighting Spain. So this shift in perspective is key to understanding the conflict. The new conflict was an endless conflict, a conflict that by definition could not end. If there is no war, there is no Basque country. If there is no Basque identity. There's no Basque identity. Okay. Without war against Spain. Without war against Spain. So fighting Spain defines the entire Basque uh, idea, the idea of a Basque people or a Basque identity. This uh, endless war concept was first introduced in Europe by Michel Foucault during a course that was delivered at the Collège de France in 1976. He, later on, the course was published and entitled Faut-il défendre la société? Do we need to defend society? It advanced the idea that politics was war by other means, somehow turning Clausewitz's main idea upside down. So yeah, um, as we were saying, Basque uh, identity um, is born from the conflict itself. Sartre said that the anti-Semitic gaze created the Jewish identity, or provided Jews with an identity. And this is similar. And of course, the enemy is to be eternal because it is functional, I suppose.